That was what Dionysius decided, and the next day he arrived at the sanctuary with friends and freedmen, and the most reliable of his servants, so as to have witnesses. He had dressed with some care, and even modestly adorned his person, seeing that he was going to meet the woman he loved. Besides, he was naturally handsome and tall, and, above all, dignified in appearance. Leonis, accompanied by Plangon, and Callerho's regular maids, went to Callerho. Lady, he said, Dionysius is very just and law-abiding man, so go into the shrine and tell him truthfully who you really are. You can be sure of getting all the help you deserve. Just speak to him simply, and don't hide any of the truth. That will evoke kind his kindness to you all the more. Callerho was reluctant to go, but she felt safe because they were to meet in a shrine. When she got there, everybody admired her even more. Dionysus was struck dumb with wonder. He was silent for a long time, but finally found his voice. Lady, he said, you know all about me. I am Dionysius. I am the first man in Miletus. In fact, practically in all Ionia. I am celebrated for my respect for the gods and my humanity. It is right and proper that you too should tell us the truth about yourself. The men who sold you said that you were from Sybaris and that your mistress was jealous of you and had sold you away from there. Callerho blushed and bowed her head. This is the first time, she said in a low voice, that I have ever been sold. I have never seen Sybaris. Dionysus looked at Leonis. I told you she wasn't a slave, he said, and in fact I predict that she will turn out to be of noble birth. Tell me everything, lady. First, your name. Callerho, she said. Dionysus liked her very name, and then she fell silent. Dionysus persisted in questioning her. Sir, she said, please do not make me talk about what has happened to me. What happened before is a dream, a fable. Now I am what I have come to be, a slave and a foreigner. As she spoke, tears ran down her cheeks, though she tried to avoid attention. Dionysus too was moved to tears, and so were all those present. Aphrodite himself, you would have said, looked sadder. Dionysus continued questioning her even more insistently. The first favor I ask of you, Callerho, he said, is to tell me about yourself. You will not be talking to a stranger. People can be related by character as well. Don't be afraid, even if you have done something dreadful. This made Callerho angry. Don't insult me, she cried. I have nothing to be ashamed of, but I am of higher rank than my present condition suggests, and I do not want people to think I am making unjustified claims. I do not want to tell a story that people who do not know the situation will not believe. My previous life says nothing about my present condition. Dionysus admired her spirit. I understand already, he said, even if you do not tell me, but tell us all the same. You can say nothing about yourself to compare to what we see. Impressive though your story be, nothing you can tell us will measure up to you. So reluctantly, Callerho began to tell her story. I am the daughter of Hemocrates, the Syracusan general. I had a sudden fall and lost all consciousness, and my parents gave me a costly funeral. Tomb robbers opened my tomb, they found me conscious again, and brought me to this place and Theron gave me to Leonis here in a deserted spot. She told them everything else, but said nothing about Chereus. Dionysus, you are Greek. You live in a humane community. You are a civilized man. Please don't be like the tomb robbers. Don't take my country and my family away from me. You are a rich man. It is a trivial matter to you to let a human being go. You will not lose what you paid for me if you give me back to my father. Hermocrates is not an ungrateful man. You know how we admire Alcinous, 
We love him for sending his suppliant back home. Well, I am your suppliant. I am a prisoner. I have lost my parents. Rescue me. And if I cannot live as a woman of birth, I prefer to die free. As he listened to her words, Dionysus began to weep, ostensibly for Calerho, but in fact for himself. He realized that he was not getting what he wanted. Have courage, Calerho, he said. Be of good heart. You shall not fail to get what you ask for. I take Aphrodite here to witness. Meanwhile, in my house, you shall be attended like a mistress, not a slave. Kellerho went away, convinced that nothing could happen to her that she did not want to happen. Dionysius said, went sadly to his own house and sent for Leonis privately. Nothing goes right for me, he said. Eros hates me. I have buried my wife and our new slave shuns me. I was hoping she was Aphrodite's gift to me and was planning for myself a life happier than that of Menelaus. Spartan Helen's husband. Even Helen, I imagine, was not as beautiful as she is. And she is persuasive too. My life is finished. The day Calerho leave here, leaves here, I shall die. At that, Leonis cried out, Sir, don't you curse yourself. You're her master. You can make her do what you want, whether she likes it or not. I bought her. I paid a talent for her. You bought her, a girl of noble birth. You miserable villain. Have you never heard of Hermocrates? He is the leader of the whole of Sicily, a man with a most distinguished record. Why, the king of Persia admires him, loves him, sends him presents every year for destroying the fleet of Persia's enemies. Athens, am I to lord it over a freeborn person? Am I Dionysius, celebrated for my moderation? to force myself on an unwilling woman, even the pirate Theron would not have forced himself on her. That was how he spoke to Leonis, but for all that he did not give up hope of winning Calerho over. Love is naturally optimistic, and he was confident that by attention he could achieve his desires. So he sent for Plangon. You have already demonstrated your concern for me he said. Now I am entrusting to you the greatest and most precious of my possessions, the foreign woman. I want her to lack for nothing. I want her to have luxury. Consider her your mistress. Serve her. Treat her with respect. And make her will dis well disposed to me. Praise me often to her. Tell her about me as you know me. And be careful to call me be careful not to call me her master. Planjon was qu a quick-witted creature and understood what he was asking her, what he was asking her to do. Unobtrusively, she returned her mind to the job and set about it rapidly. She sought out Kellerho's company, but did not tell her that she had been told to serve her. Rather, she made it seem as if she felt personal sympathy for her. She wanted to be credible as an advisor.